Um, I first found out about Rachel by reading her book, Love Junkie, and I was just so blown away by how courageous and how tough it was, even though she was talking about being addicted to love. For the reason I thought that would be much weaker, but she made it sound so badass and painful at the same time. <laughs> so I got into her class, and um, the thing about Rachel, she calls herself a literary alchemist, but really she's a literary pimp. Because she just went into shape. She just has this thing, like I went in there, I only actually have ever sat with her in that two classes, and immediately was like, no, you're doing this, this has to be done, let me switch this around, you're changing the title, and this is what the focus on your book is. Like, she put me on the streets to work, so. Anyway, so she's amazingly talented, and I look forward to studying with her more. So, Rachel Resnick. Thank you, Sosie. That was a fantastic, oh, it's so weird about having a mic. That was a great intro. Really, really yeah. appreciate it. And on the fly, too. And also, I just want to take a moment to clap for all. Now, this is the conclusion of all the students or the people who take workshop participants and one-on-one -on -one clients. Unbelievable work, right? Uh, but sometimes I hesitate starting from a really deep place because I try and get a sense of where the audience is and some people might be into that and some not. But I just have to say that I'm not only entertained but deeply moved. And I can cry. Sorry. <laughs> but that's one of those weird things that happens when you're an artist or and you're really trying to do that weird thing of digging deep so you can reach people, so you can connect with and I'm just so proud of the work that everyone did. And also, I was blown away because I was like, what? What did they do with that piece? I didn't even, because I, you know, like, we have, there's something about having a deadline and a performance and all you incredible people who are supporting the writers and readers that brings the best out of people. Sometimes you don't want to overthink it. You don't want to spend, it's like deadlines. Sometimes journalists are the ones who just like bang it out. Lawyers. But um, I'm really, really proud, and it makes me feel gratified for because I'm kind of schizophrenic in the sense of I have a writing career, which is it's necessary to be selfish in some ways. And then I have this business, Writers on Fire, where I uh, I kind of give that energy over to other people as a camp or as a mentor, whatever you want to call it. But there's a Eastern philosophical stance to it that that minds how it literally is uh, opening yourself up and giving this kind of energy that's similar to what you use for your creative project. So it's it's a, if I may, we're into making. There's a sacredness to it, and I just want to acknowledge that and how proud I am of all the, the writers and readers who have Okay. So, Because it's weird, creativity requires a certain kind of selfishness to dive down, and then when you share it with people, that's part of where it becomes something bigger than you. And in teaching, in guiding people, it's another place it becomes bigger than you. By the way, uh, I'm not being as loud as I usually am. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. So, I feel a little off my game because I don't have a phone to time myself. Just Does go. Anyone, yeah, I, actually, time. Yeah, I actually <laughs> like to have phone and know because, I look it, I, I feel very honored that all of you managed to show up here and make the time to do that, so I want to be kind of respectful of the time. Can anyone, oh, that would be brilliant. Could you have a timer here? Okay, great. I'll do that. Uh, don't do it yourself. Let me do that. I don't mind. <laughs> no, no, you can't. Yeah. I'll do it. No. So what I'm going to do, I'm also controlling. So what I'm going to do is uh, read a very short excerpt from Love Junkie, which is the last published book I have. And one of the things I feel like I can offer to people who work with me is that I'm a working writer, which on some level is Mishigas, Kakalulu, there's a craziness involved, but it's also, I can speak to what, what is that process. I can, I can share those kind of things. And, 
And by the way, I'll get to Steve, but it's no joke that he showed up. He drove a freaking hour to get here. We have a guest speaker after me, superstar guest speaker, very big deal that he showed up. Um, and we do have our books for sale, which is what all of you are going to be doing at a certain point, because it's kind of about that too. So I just want to mention that. And also remind you that um, I offered people something who showed up here, and I'm going to be starting off another virtual workshop. Carla was one of the people from the virtual, and I'm going to give $100 off to anyone who wants to sign up on the spot. So you don't have to drive anywhere. And I have some other offerings too, one-to-one -one kind of things, but I just want to mention that. Now what I'm going to do is read a very, very short, it ought to be like two minutes, tops, from Love Junkie. And then I'm going to zoom back in time and do a lighter piece because I'm feeling like some of the pieces were so wrenching that we heard. And I'm like, you know what? And I really apologize people heard it before, the Alabama piece, but we got some football in here. It was Bear Bryant all the time when I was I, last year was in high school in Alabama. So I think it's appropriate. And so that's the idea. I'm going to read a short excerpt from Love Junkie, which is about probably uh, 10 years ago or something, and then scoot back to high school to see the roots of Love Junkiness. All right. Take your shoes off, he says. I do. Now you dress. I sweep the thin black material over my head, toss it on the floor. Let me see you. Keep these on. He slowly traces my breasts, sends psychedelic currents through my nervous system. Then he pulls the plastic coil bracelet from his wrist and binds up his crazy spring sprunging hair, scoots down my body, sliding the silk thong underwear aside as he goes. Not only is the sex mind-blowing, cataclysmic, and ecstatic, it's deliciously unsustainable over time. Nirvana touched, then torn away, because as giving and godlike as he is during sex, he is equally withholding you every other way. For me, Winchester is like pure heroin. When the second Magnum Conda breaks, Winchester doesn't get enough. We are one, meant to be. This much is clear. How can it be anything else? I told him last week if I got pregnant, I would have the child. <laughs> Even if I had to raise it alone, he knows this. I am secretly exultant. If he's having unprotected sex with me, he must love me, right? How can he not love me forever? After sex that spectacular, I can see our child bouncing between us, Winchester kissing her sweetly, lifting her up in the air so the child laughs delightedly. I can see Winchester and me still clubbing when we're 60. <laughs> the other patrons clearing a path for us as we hit the dance floor. <laughs> yeah. After sex, he pulls away from me, rolls toward the wall. I frown in the dark. Why won't he spoon me after what we just shared? After practically signing a love contract to father my child? <laughs> what you thinking? <laughs> I say, vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> None yet? <laughs> huh? None of your business. That's what we say in Tortola. <laughs> he chuckles, and I move in closer. I lay my hands on his shoulders, stroke them gently. Erotically, I'm ready to go again. This ability of mine to go and go, this insatiable need for sex, is one of the bonds I create in relationships. I forge a chain playfully disguised as a ribbon, a masquerade of natural abandon and innocent lust. 
So, of course, I think he will be pleased to turn on. Instead, he shakes me from his back. Your hands are so heavy. Mm. Wow.